The most important thing, of course, is the fact that there's highly significant results when people work this way. And one of the great cognitive scientists who has studied this, her name is Eleanor Roche. Uh, she's the head of the cognitive science department at Berkeley, described all of this in some papers. And her word was, um, it's shockingly effective when people work this way together. So <clears throat> I began <clears throat> thinking about this at the age of 18 and wanted to find a way to replicate this, as I said, but ended up taking a rabbit trail in my life and became a trial lawyer uh, for 20 years, founded a law firm, and uh, had some of these experiences in big cases where we would put together, you know, big teams of people, and we were in highly challenging circumstances, very significant uh, situation where it took an extraordinary effort, and I would experience this time and time again in those, and I began doing some work, you know, trying to keep up with this. But then an, um, a big event happened in my life that actually changed my whole life, which was Watergate. My dad was the Watergate prosecutor, and um, <clears throat> we had a family ranch that I was sort of uh, raised on uh, over the years. And when he came to Washington here, he would leave on the weekends, just about every weekend, and fly down, uh, down to the ranch, which was in central Texas near Austin, uh, and find some solace and, and work there. And I was this young trial lawyer at the time, and he found that it was good for him to have somebody to talk to about the things that he might not be able to talk to people on his staff, staff particularly in those early days. And so I'm sitting there talking to him. Um, my father, I used to call him the colonel, and, um, which came out of his war years. So I would sit there and, and talk to him, and he would, he would share with me <clears throat> these transcripts and talk about his feelings about this and his instincts. And then I would go in at night and watch television, and I would see just the opposite on the television, you know, with the president saying things that were just not true. And this caused a huge disconnect. Without getting into too much detail, it... I took a, a big right turn in my life, uh, left the law firm a few years after that um, to found something called the American Leadership Forum, which uh, was designed to create um, servant leaders um, of people who were essentially like me, you know, in their mid-40s, uh, early 40s, late 30s, and who had spent most of their life in their profession and sort of making money and doing well for themselves but not giving very much attention to the, to the common good. And so I started the American Leadership Forum, which had its uh, 25th year anniversary a couple of uh, years ago, and I'm, I'm very pleased at the way it's progressed. But the reason I'm mentioning the, uh, the ALF was that at the very beginning of that particular development, um, I met an individual who provided about half the answer for me about how to do this work. And um, his name is Dr. David Bohm. He's the architect of quantum theory. Um, Einstein said that David Bohm taught him, Einstein, everything he knew about quantum theory. And um, it's a bit of a story about how all that happened. We don't have time to get into it, but uh, it was on a Sunday morning when I saw an article in the London. I was living in London, running our, our London office at the time, and it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. I'd just taken a long run through Hyde Park, came home and uh, was doing my stretching and sort of through the, new, the Sunday Times on the floor and looked down there, and there was this big headline that said, you know, David Bohm, the new algebra of algebras, wholeness and the implicate order. And I, I didn't understand any of that, but it spoke directly to me, and I ended up saying, my God. 
And I started reading this, this article, which was beautifully written, very clear. And I said, this guy has got part of the answer. And I started madly dialing, you know, on the telephone and by some miracle un- got him on the end of the line this Sunday morning, you know, 8, eight o'clock in the morning by this time. And, and by another miracle, he agreed to uh, cancel everything the next day and spent the whole day with me starting at 8 and we ended up at 4.30 or 5. And I came to him with this question telling him about the Waco experience and saying, you know, this was the thing I had been questing for for so long. How could I recreate this in this new American leadership forum on a reliable basis, you know, without having a crisis like this? And he spent the day explaining to, to me his view of how I could do that. Now, he didn't give me the answer, but he gave me the following inspiration and deep understanding. He took me into his laboratory and he said, I want to show you what we call the bubble chamber. And he said, we can take subatomic particles and we can separate them. You can take two paired particles that are spinning together. You can separate them and um, you can put one keep one in London and put one in Washington, D.C., you can change the spin of one and instantly the spin of the other changes. And he said that's called Bell's theorem. It was, it was first uh, suggested by one of his students, uh, John Stuart Bell, who was a Swiss physicist. But then it was proved experimentally hundreds and hundreds of times after that. And he explained all this to me, and he, he looked up from the bubble chamber, and he said, so you can see, Mr. Jaworski, that, there, that number one, this is the way the universe operates. This is the way subatomic particles behave. We are made up of this same matter, and therefore this applies to humans and inanimate uh, objects as well. He said, the fact is that there is separation in life, but there is not separateness. There is separation, but there is not separateness. He said, we are all connected. And he said, he was very formal with me. And he said, so you can see, Mr. Jaworski, that that this can provide the answer to, to the question you've put to me that in my judgment, what you need to do in this leadership development program is find a way to break the self-imposed boundaries between people so that we can, so they can operate in this connected way. And he said, if you could take 20 or 30 people at a time and have them operate this way, it would be like a miracle. And they would begin operating as a single intelligence for the good of their community or their region or the system that they're operating in. And he said, with people operating together as a single intelligence, there is huge power in that. And he said, he just looked at me and he said, I charge you with that responsibility to find a way to do this with people. And I said, but how do I do that? And he said, well, that's my injunction to you. You must find out the answer to it. So I walked out of there, you know, with my head spinning and um, not knowing at all what to do. I mean, here I was a trial lawyer, had no understanding of any of this. But deep down in my heart, I knew he had given me, you know, at least a partial answer to this thing I'd been after all my life. And I was walking through Hyde Park on the way back from his, his office And it suddenly occurred to me that one way to do this would be to take people out in nature into this completely unmediated environment and put them out in silence for three days and give them some tools and practices beforehand and that they would find this common ground and this capacity to connect up with each other at a deeper way. Now, I didn't understand the theory of it. 
It just came to me in that moment. But I knew that's what I was going to do. And for the next 10 years, I put groups like this together in places all over the country. Um, there's now, I think, three or 4,000 people that have gone through this experience. And, if they, and they, they went through a 43-day uh, learning experience for the whole year. Um, but the thing that they all talk about is that nature experience. I mean, years afterwards, we all get together, you know, and have these um, uh, reunions, and, and that's the one thing they remember. It's a, it's a liminal experience and a seminal experience. So that was the first thing, and I, it provided half the answer for me, in effect. Then you fast forward. I went to Shell, as John mentioned, and, and led the scenario planning team, and I learned a lot there that helped me. Uh, hooked up with a man named Francesco Varela, who was a disciple of uh, Humberto Maturana and others out of Chile, and um, it furnished a whole new um, sort of dimension for me. Um, and Peter Sange came to me uh, while I was in London at Shell when I was getting ready to leave there and my tenure was up. And he said, we've been threatening to work together for years. Why don't you just move to Boston? I said, but what am I going to do? He said, well, I, I don't know. We'll figure it out. So I just picked up my family and just moved to Boston <laughs> and, uh, and began working with Peter, um, helping him with what's known as the MIT Organizational Learning Center at that time, um, which was you know, part of the Sloan School. And um, he had just written The Fifth Discipline, or had just published it at that point, and had a flood of people and interest. And I was helping him take that whole organization on a global basis. And ended up uh, working with some big companies doing transformational work. One of them was uh, two very large energy companies who wanted to merge their downstream operations. And, um, and this was going to create the largest downstream operation in the world. This is you know, the refineries, the marketing, and all of that. And um, it cleared the Federal Trade Commission. And I'm sitting in the back of the room with 250 of the top leaders in the merged organization. And I was asked to help do the integration of this over a year's period of time. So I'm sitting in the back listening to the CEO who's standing up there exhorting the people, you know, and getting them all ready to charge forward. And I really admired this guy um, because sort of in the midst of his remarks, he just kind of threw his, his notes away and said, look, I'm going to speak from the heart here. He said, We're, we've all been raised for 20, 25 years in these two big oil companies, and we're operating, and we've learned to operate as elephants. But he said, our competition now is emerging as a group of gazelles out there, and we're going to be left in the dust. We're not going to be in the phone book in 10 years if we don't learn the, how to be more, entrepreneur, uh, be more entrepreneurial in our approach and make new discoveries and create new realities in this organization and not operate as we had. And I'm sitting in the back of the room, and I'm saying, oh, and he said, honestly, I don't know how to do this, which I admired. You never hear a CEO talk like that. He's always sort of, I know it all, you know, and therefore there's no real room for learning. But, but this guy said just the opposite. And the same thing that happened to me in Hyde Park happened in the back of that room. It just suddenly occurred to me, I know how to do this. And it relates to the conversation, to the experience in Waco, the conversation with David Bohm, and something else I haven't been able to do, which is put a process together to actually recreate this, this experience collectively for people. But I thought to myself, if I had six or nine months and an opportunity to connect up with uh, a real cognitive scientist or a social scientist in this field. I could figure this out. So just, you know, I just went to this CEO and I said, I know how to do this, but I can't articulate it yet. I need for you to give me 
and I named a big 